Hello everybody, welcome to What's Your Theory? My name is Stephen T. Harper, and today we have another integral chat with Jeff Salzman of the DailyEvolver.com. Today's going to be part three of a series we've been doing that's basically values we cannot evolve without, right? So these are the, the good parts about traditionalism, the good parts about modernism, the good parts about postmodernism that we need to remember to keep in mind to carry with us as we head into what hopefully will be a bright, bright future as a species. But you never know. Uh, this is a good show. It's a little long. It's a little more than an hour, so I'm going to jump right into it without much of a preamble. We give you a pretty good setup at the beginning, so there's no real need to to get into that, especially if you've been listening to the other uh, parts of this series. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Jeff Salzman about values we can't evolve without from the postmodern mindset. Stay tuned. Once again, with Jeff Salzman of the Daily Evolver. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Steve. Hey, everybody. And this is going to be part three of a three-part uh, conversation where we're looking at the gold of each individual level on the big chart that we show you all the time. And I wanted to ask Jeff at the beginning, before we get started, if we could just to catch people up, if they're listening for the first time, especially if they're listening and not able to look at this chart, what are these three levels that we're talking about that are all happening at the same time? You know, you talk about the culture war between these three groups. It's right. an excellent definition of what the culture war really is. I'm hoping you could go over that. And then the idea of this conversation is how do we get to that next level where everything, mm -hmm. where we can integrate everybody's good ideas together. Right. So if you could start with, Right now, we're we're traditional, we're modern, and we're postmodern mindsets all living together. Could you talk That's about right. that a little bit? Yeah, uh, the traditional mindset is the world of the what we would call the social conservative for the most part. It's going to be people who are religious, nationalistic. They are critiqued as being uh, xenophobic. Uh, they prefer traditional sex roles. This is a lot of Trump's base. This is about 30% of the population in the United States, and, and they're online. They're, and they've been online since traditionalism emerged into human history about 5,000 years ago with the idea of monotheism and uh, the idea of right and wrong and good and bad. And it was a civilizing force and a very positive one. And, uh, but now it's the, the, the lagging, lagging edge of the mainstream. The next stage is modernity, and we did a we've done we did a talk on traditionalism. We did one on modernity, and we're going to finish it out here with postmodernity. But modernity comes in about 500 years ago with the scientific revolution, uh, the idea that the world is knowable and we can figure things out. We don't just have to rely on the religious books and doctrines. And then the Enlightenment, the idea of the rights of man and um, freedom of the individual, that there's sovereignty actually rests in my breast, <laughs> not in the king. You know? And that is a, a whole new thing that brought on you know, the scientific technological revolution, tripled lifespans, created um, um, you know, a modern world, basically. Right, right. Uh, and then we had a, a rise out of that at the, pretty much the middle of the last century, mid-1900s, uh, and, it, and it particularly flourished in the 60s culturally, is post-modernity. Okay. And that's what we want to talk about today. And post-modernity are the liberals or the progressives. The, sec the um, modernists are kind of secular. 
They, they're not as ideological as either tr the traditionalists or the postmodernists. Right. They're kind of pragmatic. They make sure the trains run on time. We really need them. Uh, <laughs> and they're, doing, they're, they're keeping the world running. Right. Uh, but the postmodernists have a critique of them, uh, and that is that they're materialistic, that they're insensitive to other cultures, and um, that they're uncool. You know, they're, and, and, and that's the sort of uh, ethos of postmodernity is that there is, uh, after the middle of the 20th century and the conflagrations of World War I and World War II and all of the depressions and all of that, people lost all faith in the stories of um, traditionalism, which traditionalism says that my God is going to come back and we're going to, you know, that's going to be the end of history. And we are uh, the chosen people. And we are the chosen people. Whoever we are. Exactly. Modernists have this idea that once the world becomes rational and scientific, then everything's going to be okay. And, and, it, and it brings in this idea of progress. Right. Progress. After World War II and the concentration camps and the nuclear bombs and all of that, that all of those were off people enough with your grand narratives of history right um, there is no absolute truth all there is is power dynamics and if and that's the way you look at history is that it's just one group dominating another and that is a way of looking at history this is postmodern you're talking this about this is postmodernism right. okay. yeah and this is the reaction to modernity also um, again they critique modernity as being uh, materialistic as so, being shallow Yes, as being soulless, absolutely. And what comes online here is this desire to rehabilitate and bring back online the people who have been left out of the previous stages. So mm -hmm. what green post-modernity or progressives say about modernity is that you divide the world into winners and losers. Right. And the losers, you know, look at them, they need to be taken care of. So um, if, 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 if traditionalism divided the world between you're in or you're out, well, modernity yeah. divides the world into winners and losers. Yeah. And it, uh, seeks well, to, go ahead. Well, let me just, uh, uh, one of the ways we look at traditionalism is the saints and the sinners. They, right. they, that, that's, that's the division there. So you're either in with the chosen people or you're the heretics. Right. So that's what they do. And, you know, postmodernity wants to rehabilitate that too. Postmodernity has its own thing where it divides the world. Right. And which leads us, which leads us to, to eventually what, what, what we hope to be talking about here, which is the actual heart of integral theory is that each one of these stages is replaced when it's replaced by the next one, they still managed to keep what was what's great about what was there before. Or at least that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Pe people keep that, which they is hate why themselves for it, but they do. Yes, which is which is why we exist today more or less on a spectrum that yes. incorporates all of these things. Yes. So we're not we're not pointing at someone and saying you're the traditionalists and and you know you couldn't possibly understand the modern world. That's not what that's not what what this theory is saying. Right. I worry about it sometimes because I feel like it sounds like that's what it's saying. Cause it's, when we talk about it in shorthand, it kind of sounds that way, right. but really we're talking about a spectrum. We're all incorporating these ideas into our, our lives and also what it means to be alive right now. Yeah. We're the, for the first time in history, we have three or four, of these stages online at the same time in the same cultures. Right. You know, Five thousand years ago, everybody was traditional. It was you didn't have to figure out what that meant. Right. Uh, now we not only have all three of them in or four sometimes in the culture at the same time, we have them in ourselves. And what is and the we, promise we of, can of feel them? You know, we can feel our modern. You can we can feel our traditional. We can feel our postmodern, and we can feel the how they're at war with each other. Right. And, 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 you know, f from an integral perspective, then, which is the stage that comes out of postmodernity, and integral is just that. It seeks to integrate the best of the previous stages. And it has a sort of a friendlier um, attitude. The, 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 the three stages left on, to their own devices 
hate each other and are at war with each other. Sometimes literally for a lot of human history, particularly modernity came, they all warred. War yeah. was you know, end endemic. But now um, the war is being fought as a culture war because yeah. the center of gravity is modern, even traditionalists these days. We, we can, you know, there's some new thinking in Integral that there's, a horizontal evolution within trad traditionalism, within all of these stages. Right. So traditionalism, when it came online, um, was brutal. You know, it, it, the, the witch burning eras. Right. And now traditionalism, it was also slaveholding. You know, all of the, those things were just standard in tradition. Right. Now traditionalism, people have maybe a heart that's traditional and they love home and hearth and God, and, and they don't, you know, they're not multicultural, but they still go to work and they work in the modern world and they, you know, send their kids to college. And, yeah. you know, so it's a, it's a bit of a mess, but integral helps us to sort it out. And time helps to sort it out. I, I, Cause I think it's important to mention when, when we're talking about these things. So there was also slavery through half of the time that we're calling modernity. But what's interesting about it is modernity, the coming, the, the, the dawning of, of um, that abil the ability to think about things in that way is what eventually, at least in the, in what, you know, the developed world, did away with slavery, right? Yeah. So there, there certainly was slavery at the beginning of the Enlightenment and, and at the ending of the Middle Ages and all that. And it carried through in the United States um, legally and technically until the yep. Civil War. Where some of the Enlightenment thinkers own slaves. Right. Like Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. So it's all a matter of working things out. Yeah. The human race is growing, it's evolving, which is what what integral theory is really about. It's an, it's an, exp, it's an explanation of how consciousness evolution works. Yes. Right. So right. one thing that I think is really important to note here, and I'll, I'll put this chart up again while we're talking about it, um, is the speed at which this things, these things begin to, to change. So you had the, the tribal mindset going on for 15,000 years, and then 10,000 years into that, we hit, you know, what, what we call traditional, but again, at the time, 5,000 years ago, this is the new radical Thing that allows the, the large city states to work together and, and nation states. Um, and then now 4,500 years later, modernity comes in. 400 years later, post-modernity. So you see the speed picking up. Uh, we're in post-modernity right now. And as you have mentioned, that, that integral theory is positing that this next level after postmodern the beginning of the integral level is happening right now. It's not, it hasn't reached its, what do you call it when it sort of saturates the culture enough? As, you know, we think of it as moving in probability clouds. So we talk about a center of gravity. Where's your center of gravity? And most important in a way, where's your self sense? Where's your heart? You know, right. where do you really feel most at home, despite the fact that you're competent in other other stages? Right. So that's uh, and we would say that maybe two to five percent of the population in the developed world has an integral center of gravity. And again, the promise of this, which is what makes it so appealing to me, is if you're a regular watcher of the show, we're trying to reach Star Trek. Keep away from Planet of the Apes. That's all, <laughs> that's all we're trying to do that. here. So, you know, in, in having these chats about integral theory, I think integral theory is a great uh, tool for, for seeing a path or even just sort of following the, the direction that it's going, you know, seeing it from where we need to go, but also just seeing how it happens. I think, I think it's a really interesting idea. And the beauty just before we launch into the actual conversation, the beauty of this next level that is happening right now is it's the first one that doesn't think it's the only thing that's correct. Yes. It allows for the other things to exist. It says, yes, of course. It's the one that, that, actually it's the one that maybe is just able to look at the whole thing in the way that I just described. Yeah, it sees evolution. Uh, that, that's one of the insights of, um, of, 
of, of um, integral is that it, it sees the evolution of, of consciousness and culture mm -hmm. in a way that the previous stages didn't. Um, the, you could argue that modernity and the enlightenment saw that there was an evolution of culture too, but they thought that theirs was the apogee, that right. you could never get any further than rational thinking. And, uh, and Integral would say, boy, you sure need rational thinking. It can't do without rational thinking, but it's not the only thing. Right. And, and so it, it integrates, you know, the, the spirituality. It, it, it integrates, uh, you know, sort of the animal minds that we all have right. in ways that are beautiful and re-enchant the world. Right. And that's important. So in postmodern, post-modernity, which is what we're, we're going to talk about, the gold of post-modernity, the things about post-modernity that we, that we don't want to leave behind, right? Yes. While, we're, while we're arguing about, about this and while we're, we're fighting over, you know, social, social justice and social... I can't say the word social justice warriors and all the kind of stuff that you see people arguing about. Fine. Let's have the argument, but we want to talk about the things that we don't want to leave behind. Right. Right. So I have a video that I'd like to play. I actually have two videos that I want to play today. Oh, cool. Um, the first one is short. It's just two clips. Um, and I feel like it, it sets up a lot of what we were just talking about, which is this, uh, this movement of, 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 of consciousness evolution, the, this movement in the way people's minds work and where, the, where, where new ideas sort of seep into a position where they can start to spread, right? In a, in a good way. But I also, well, so this, this, what I'm gonna show you is a clip from Star Trek from 1969 followed by a modern ad campaign for uh, cell phones. And I think it's interesting to, to see. So 1969 is the, is the height of the cultural revolution happening in the United States, right? Um, this is when postmodernism really came in and staked out their territory and said yes. more war in Vietnam and, and civil rights very much about the hard edges of, of modernity being softened a little bit with like, let's remember things like, like justice and, or not just remember them, let's elevate them to the importance that they really have. Like what's more important than yeah. justice. And include more people in our circle of people worthy of justice. Right. Yeah. So what I'm going to play here is I think it is baby boomers who are creating Star Trek for younger baby boomers. And they might also be, was it silent generation that was before baby boomers? Yes, I believe so. Okay. It might, these might actually be silent generation creators. I'm not really sure what generation Gene Roddenberry was, but this is the height of, of the cultural revolution. And these are artists in high commerce, liberal Hollywood, right? Uh, creating and disseminating these ideas, not creating the ideas, but disseminating these ideas into mass consciousness. Um, cool. And it's followed by uh, Gen Xers creating an advertising campaign. So the, so the children who grew up watching Star Trek uh, creating an advertising campaign along with millennials. So Gen Xers and millennials in the ad business. Again, mass dissemination of an idea but i would say notice when you're watching this video it's only each one is only a minute clip when you watch the star trek clip notice how absolutely on the money it is for what postmodern activism is is about justice things yeah. like that um and then see how it follows up with with uh, selling phones to young people this troubled planet is a place of the most violent contrasts. Those who receive the rewards are totally separated from those who shoulder the burdens. It is not a wise leadership. Here on Stratus, everything is incomparably beautiful and pleasant. The high advisor's charming daughter, Droxine, particularly so. 
The name Droxine seems appropriate for her. I wonder, can she retain such purity and sweetness of mind and be aware of the life of the people on the surface of the planet? There, the harsh life in the mines is instilling the people with a bitter hatred. The young girl who led the attack against us when we beamed down was filled with the violence of desperation. If the lovely Droxine knew of the young miner's misery, I wonder how the knowledge would affect her. Remember back in school, when you either invited the new kid over to your table, or you didn't? If you did, that was a cool move. That was an and move. And moves take guts, but they can mean everything. Their and move is to put wings on a bicycle. Now, we fly. When enough people have an and view, the world changes. Forever. If you think about it, you're only here because of an and moment. Opening yourself up isn't easy. But when you do, it's hard to forget. Because it leads to something new. Something better. That's why we need this. And this. And them. And you. Yeah, you. Watching this right now. Because everyone doing the same thing won't move us forward. But everyone doing their own thing. Together. Can. Very good, yeah. And that, that if I may comment, the, the, Please. the Star Trek, um, you know, expressed that postmodern progressive critique of modernity that says that here is this group of people basically living off of the labors of other people. Right. And uh, that was, of course, the, the uh, impetus around Marxism and, and, and so forth which are critiques of modernity. Uh, but that still is, you know, a, a part of the, it, it's what we, we need to tease apart in, um, in modernity when we think about what's the gold and what isn't. Because post-modernity also becomes reflexively anti-modern. And so it mm -hmm. sees corporations, it has a natural antipathy to corporations. It has this idea that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, when actually the rich get richer and the poor get richer too. And that modernity and capitalism have brought millions, billions of people out of poverty. And that there is a golden goose in there that needs to be maintained mm -hmm. as we get beyond this idea that, um, what is it? 12 families own half of the wealth in the world or something. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's these, there, there's, there's this, the, this spin that modernity has where people who ownership just brings in incommensurate re rewards that have a, you know, the, the moral, the moral intuition says that's not right. right. And so that's what we're, you know, working in as we move into post-modernity and, and, and it's happening. It's, it's astonishing in a way. In the uh, early 1900s, 1.5% 1 or something like that of the gross domestic product was used for social welfare. Now it's an average in the developed world of somewhere between 20 and 25%. Mm. And, uh, and that just happened, whether it's a Republican, Democrat, that's, there's an inexorable sort of redistribution that is already in progress. It's going to continue. But uh, that's the, the gains that post-modernity have made economically that are really important. And that, that deals with that first video, that redistribution thing, that part that becomes sort of morally offensive when we yeah. see people with, you know, I was just down in Cabo San Lucas and looking at some of these yachts. Right. And there I was staying in a beautiful resort and, you know, there's all these complicated things and a lot of people, you know, a lot of, you know, I'm a good old bold or liberal, you know, I'm green, I'm neck deep in green myself. And I have all kinds of conflicts around turning on lights and the, the my carbon footprint and mm -hmm. these, you know, that I still eat animals. You know, these things have a, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a conscious hypocrite right. around these things, as a lot of people are. And, you know, working on it, I guess, but also feeling the pull of by other stages. 
I thought it was interesting in the Star Trek clip, the way Spock framed the problem was this young sort of, she was sort of like a princess type character in the, in the beautiful cloud city that lives above the troglodytes, which they literally called them troglodytes in that episode of the show. Um, it was her youth you know, and it was a matter of, it was, he framed the whole conversation strictly in a matter of awareness, as a matter of awareness. Yes. I That's wonder what, what would happen if she knew. Yep. You know, and it's that to me was like, so this is now seeping into the culture. They weren't really talking about stuff like that very much before, right. you know, only in really in science fiction at the time which, you know, science fiction is the mythology of the modern world, basically. So as that seeps, it certainly, it certainly went into me as a child when I was watching these shows in, in reruns 10 years later. Um, I, I found that very interesting. And then, and then the other thing, the second bit of it was, what, almost 50 years later, you know, and it was, it, it wasn't, I mean, first of all, it was a commercial, so it's not angry, right? It's a, it's a hopeful thing. It's trying to make people feel good. But what it's putting out there, with, with, which what I just have always thought was a brilliant campaign by Android, be together, not the same, because that's, that's the thing. Like, you know, that, that, that is the, the defining thing of the, the millennials and the, and the generation coming after them is that freedom of expression, freedom to be yourself, but inclusion, everything is inclusive. And it used a lot of the language that, that Spock was saying, he, but just less, it wasn't judgmental, I suppose. It was the, or I don't know if judgmental is the right word. It was, uh, what, what is a more hopeful edge to being judgmental? It was aspirational? Yes. About inclusion. Yeah. Right. So it was it was a very similar message. Yeah. But a different attitude. And the other thing that I thought was very interesting about that from the from the idea of the of it the consciousness evolution moving through history, moving through time, is that's exactly the kind of thing that people that I know with tr with more traditional mindsets that's the kind of thing that makes them nervous. It's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that, that they're somewhat afraid of, certainly suspicious of. It is that speech that Spock gave is liberal Hollywood indoctrinating our children, yes. indoctrinating them into something that I think is a great idea. Right? Well, and if you look at, uh, you know, this is the traditionalist critique of Hollywood. It's why they hate them so much. I mean, the business just the, the cultural message is business corporations evil christians hypocrites you know that it's that there's some exceptions for sure but the culture really and, and that's what postmodernity does it attacks the institutions right uh, in, in a way that uh, undermines them and that's actually progress but it doesn't feel that way if you're identified with the institutions in exactly the same way as you've explained before, how modernity attacks the um, religion. It, it attacks religion, but it, it attacks things that are that are. It attacks all of religion and and what's the word? Uh, uh, spirituality, superstition, magic, superstition. All of it. Yeah. Right. So in so doing, it throws the baby out with the bathwater. Right. That's the danger. Yeah. That's yeah. that's where you get. A, a whole different kind of ideology. The, the Richard yeah, every, every stage throws the previous baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> right. So we can see you know, that happening with the postmodern throwing yeah. out what you just said. Hey, wait a minute. Let's not forget that we're feeding billions of people yeah. that we used to do. Yeah. And and it's also it's this it's this need as it happens faster and faster is it's got to be better right now. Yeah. You know, like yeah. well, no, like you know, modernity got rid of slavery. But yeah. it took them 300 years to do it. And tripled lifespans and created, you know, a, a but piece. the point is it doesn't happen right away. No, it does not happen right away. People were thinking modern thoughts 300 years before the French Revolution. Right. 
Yeah. And people are thinking postmodern thoughts 200 years ago. Absolutely, they were. As we've yeah. said, we're on a spectrum here. Everybody yeah, isn't. None of us people fit neatly think of Emerson and the transcendentalists, uh, Whitman. Uh, these people were, you know, leading the charge. Mm -hmm. and, and then you get Mencken and, and Mark Twain and these people. They were postmodern early. But in the beatniks, you know, and then finally in the 60s, it just, it was a cultural juggernaut. And so there's, there's a leading edge. There's always a leading edge, yes. right? Of, again, I think it's, well, and it, it is the way it is in this chart. It is presented as a spectrum. I just think it's important to, to keep thinking about it that way, that there's yeah. bleed over from all of them. And there's always a leading edge. So, so you're just describing, you know, Emerson and Mark Twain as a leading edge of postmodernism uh, 150 years ago. Well, now this this integral level that sees the world as alive and evolving, which sort of almost sounds like something that would be acceptable to a modern mind, but not quite. Not, it's yeah. a little too wishy-washy. It's a little too not scientific to see the world as alive and holistic. Wait, hold on a second, right? Postmodern people don't have a problem understanding those words, but right. this this leading edge, there are people alive right now that are able to hold multiple perspectives. That's what it says on this line here. That That's the thing, can see what makes sense about postmodern, can see what makes sense about modern and traditional and not feel the need to kill everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I think actually your second, uh, the, the commercial really was a great transmission of that in a way. The, even that saying that you, you the, together but not the same, that's actually integral. Yeah. The, the millennials have a sort of a, just an integral sensibility. They're, they're, they're tired of the fight. You can see it with uh, these young people at the Stoneman Douglas High School and stuff. It's just amazing. How reasonable they are, you know? Yeah, they're anti-gut, you know, there's, you could say they're the political culture wars, but they're not in, in the same way that my generation was. Well, they don't have the same judgmental qualities that we did. They also aren't, like, I think there's an assumption because of the way that, because of the way we set up our conversations in this society, there's, a, there's an assumption if you're anti-gun, then you are a far, far left liberal. And that does not seem to be true of these kids at all. Their, right. their, their point of view, I just jotted down some notes because I figured we'd get to that. Their point of view, the common denominator of what they're all talking about is common sense and, and anger at a lack of common sense and a disinterest in the flawed conventional wisdom. So we're not scheduled. Hallelujah. Yeah. So all of the stuff that we're that we freak out about. And again, it's really it's it is distressing to me to see Facebook is the thing that bothers me the most. I'm I'm I know that the the youngest people don't even look at Facebook, but people my age do <clears throat> and it's sort of how you know, we we keep up and Oh man, am I seeing some stuff that's discouraging from people my age that, and it so breaks into this. It's that traditional suspicion, like the suspicious of these kids and the motivations of, of, you know, how could they possibly be having a march without organizations? It must be George Soros, you know, or, oh. <laughs> you know, and it's like, <laughs> just, yeah. you know, so yeah. I find myself. Well, there's an old saying that progress precedes funeral by funeral. Mm. And, you know, the old generation's ideas and contractions die with them. And yeah. that's the story of history, too. And we're actually seeing this in real time. Boy, are you seeing it in real time. I mean, the, the, listening to those kids talk and seeing like, I mean, yes, they are being helped by people that are older than them. It, this isn't a school project. Right. Of course, they're being helped by people that are older than them. But the people that are older than them who have been, <sighs> we're locked in this world where, you know, you have the fire hose of information that we all drink out of, you know, and, and trying really hard in this new world that just came about, you know, with, with social media. It's only been around for 10 years. We're all trying to figure out yeah. how it works and, and how to, um, to navigate it, yep. 
the older people have found uh, a voice that works. Th these kids' voice works because their point is not only do we not care about all these various different cul-de-sacs that you've driven down, you know, and you're, everyone's got to, you have to please these people and you have to please those people. And, and if you do this, then you're way over the line above. Not only do we not care about that, we literally don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> what, we, yeah. what we want is common sense, yeah. right? And it's like, oh, thank God. Okay, so we don't have to talk about all the stupid shit anymore. Yeah. Common sense, is this working? And people are going, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And that's the nature of integral thinking is, you know, it's common sense, but it's, it's actually post-ideological in a sense. It's willing to take from everywhere and it's willing to be friendly to everyone yes. and to respect their worldview. They, at these three stages live in different worlds in a way. We call them world spaces. They mm -hmm. really don't understand each other. At, at integral, I, I always love what Claire Graves, one of the great integral pioneer researchers said that integral is the universal donor. It's the stage that can relate to and, you know, uh, be friends with uh, all of the previous stages and work with. And it's, and, and, and it just is, you know, lovely to see that coming online, with these younger people. And I would say that that's also happening worldwide. Uh, yeah. and, and it's one of the, we talk about how evolution evolves in these various domains of life. So there's the first person, it's how I see myself and my whole interiority. A postmodern interiority is different than modern and traditional and, and integral as well. Uh, also how we deal with each other, the second person, the culture, our relationships and so forth. Right. And then there's the third person, which is the world that we've created, the technological world. And the big te technological a feature of post-modernity is the internet, yeah. period. Just whether it's social media or the websites or whatever, and young people around the world are getting exposed to perspectives and other people and they're having arguments and sometimes it ain't pretty, but they're in the arena with each other in a way that is metabolizing a yeah. lot of the contractions and the you know hardened worldviews of their parents, grandparents, and so forth. And you combine that with the, with the other fact that the internet and social media brings, which is the ability to tap instantaneously into the power of the sheer size of the entire generation. From a practical point of view, yesterday um, was the school walkout, a national walkout. And tens of thousands of students did this simultaneously all around the country. And yeah, so the news media was there ready to cover it and all that stuff. But you know what? They could have done that without telling anybody. They could have done that. <laughs> with 16, their own tom, tom drums? No, yeah, no, with just, with just chatting with each other. That's what I'm saying, yeah. 16 and 17 year olds have access to communication avenues that people older than that are barely aware of. Like they know that it exists, but they're not following it. Right. <laughs> so if there, if there wasn't a 30 year old tapped into MSNBC, because you know maybe they are helping to organize these things. Maybe it is someone saying, hey, we've got something here. Uh, the kids are, marked, are gonna walk out of school, right? So the cameras are ready. They could have done that. They right. could have just shown up to school and every kid in the country could have got up, walked out without anyone knowing that they were going to do it. Yeah. And yesterday was awesome. But either way, what a show of power that is. Yeah. A show of, look, we can do things all at the same time, right? So we can vote for one person. Be careful who you put up there to vote for because we also were just kids. Yep. Right. Like what if Donald Trump was smart? What if Donald Trump actually did have an agenda? Someone could do that. Someone could show up and say, I'm exactly what everybody needs. And suddenly every 18 year old in the country votes for the first time ever. Right. Which yep. I have a feeling is going to happen next year or this year rather. Yeah. Every 18 year old. Oh, how ironic that it's 2018. 
Every 18 year old in the country is going to vote. And that's never happened before. Yeah. Well, and you, you can see the uh, statistics about uh, millennials and pr particularly the people, uh, the younger people born after the year 2000, uh, under 18. Um, their progressive values are deeply installed mm -hmm. for the most part. And um, so, yeah, and they're just about to come online here uh, uh, officially. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and that's true around the world. Uh, and so that's, it, it, when we talk about how um, uh, each stage comes on quicker than the previous one and how the uh, uh, evolution is accelerating, the, the way of, uh, Integral is going to come online is just that multi-perspectivalism, multi the ability to take on the perspectives of, of you know, what used to be your political enemy, um, people that you didn't understand before, and to have basically a bigger consciousness mm -hmm. that's not gripped around any particular worldview, but is a spacious consciousness within which all worldviews arise and are available. And that's a radical new, that's, we talk about that being the first person mm -hmm. um, the quality of, um, of integral thinking. So postmodernism is right on the edge of that. Like they almost have Absolutely. that, except that they're still exclusive. Yes. What they'll say is that we accept anybody of any race, creed, color, national origin, gender, whatever, as long as they agree with our progressive values. Right. Exactly. Right. Perfect. So, yeah. So I have another video to play. This one, we're flying by here. We've already been going for 50 minutes, so I should probably get cool. to this one. Cool. This is longer. And it's a little harder to follow because it's heavy on Terrence McKenna. So, so everyone watching at home, you've got to listen up here. Um, what I think is interesting about this is Terrence McKenna, who of course uh, died 20 years ago, um, is basically um, laying out what the problem is. And then what you just said, uh, when you were talking about the, the integral values of inclusivity, um, multiculturalism, again, multiculturalism, and well, that's it. I mean, I think this follows nicely from the first video that we played. Um, and I do, th I think that this is Terrence McKenna basically laying out what the problem with the world really is at this point in time. And then people of a new generation, uh, this is a, a guy named, uh, Prince Aya. EA, I think it's pronounced Aya. He's a big YouTube star, millions of hits. He's really, he's terrific. He's, he's, I'm not exactly sure what you would call him other than a YouTube star, but he's good. If you don't know him, you'll like this. I, I, I do not. Will. I mean, science is not reason. Reason is a different domain. And, and I think anything which is unreasonable, ultimately unreasonable, is just patently absurd. I am not black. I mean, that's what the world calls me, but it's not me. I didn't come out of my mother's womb saying, hey everybody, I'm black. No, I was taught to be black. And you were taught to call me that, along with whatever you call yourself. It's just a label. Every society that's always existed has had the built-in assumption that they only needed to find out 5% more about reality and then it would all fall into place and that they had the right tools for doing that. And, uh, but this, we look back then with this great sense of superiority on the naivete of the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, the Maya, the 17th century English, everybody, we look back on their naivete. But in fact, our own cultural enterprise is obviously fraught with a peculiar illogic and childishness and naivete. I mean, we're a culture that, uh, you know, robs our children to create a potlatch culture in the present. And this will look fairly 
this would look fairly pathological from any cultural perspective outside our own. See, from birth, the world force feeds us these labels. And eventually, we all swallow them. We digest and accept the labels, never, ever doubting them. But there's one problem. Labels are not you and labels are not me. Labels are just labels. But who we truly are is not skin deep. See, when I drive my car, no one would ever confuse the car for me. Well, when I drive my body, why do you confuse me for my body? Culture is the sanctioned virtual reality. And it is put in place by the machinery of local language, you see. And so then you're born into this circumstance and you're told, you know, you are a male child, you are a citizen, you are a citizen of the United States, you are a Christian, you are a Jew, you will go to college, you will do this. And you, this you never question. It's called the social contract. It hasn't gone unnoticed by Western philosophers. It's just, it's gone unnoticed by those of us who are its foremost victims. They try to tell you that you're in a social contract, but when you ask to see your signature on the document, they tell you that you were born into this contract. Well, what the hell kind of contract is that? It means that you were born into a kind of enslavement to a linguistically empowered paradigm of virtual reality within which you will walk around your entire life constant, uh, you know, congratulating yourself on its accomplishments and uh, ignoring its uh, contradictions and weaknesses. Let me break it down. See, our bodies are just cars that we operate and drive around. The dealership we call society decided to label mine the black edition, yours the Irish or white edition. And with no money down, 0% APR and no test drive, we were forced to own these cars for the rest of our lives. Forgive me, but I fail to see the logic or pride in defining myself or judging another by the cars we drive. Because who we truly are is found inside. But within every human being, there is a kind of, at least the possibility of a revulsion against this kind of uh, anesthesia of uniqueness because that's what it is. You can put your uniqueness to sleep. I just want to ask one question. Who would you be if the world never gave you a label? Never gave you a box to check? Would you be white, black, Mexican, Asian, Native American, Middle Eastern, Indian? No, we would be one. We would be together. No longer living in the era of calling human beings black people or white people these labels that will forever blind us from seeing a person for who they are, but instead seeing them through the judgmental, prejudicial, artificial filters of who we think they are. Why not admit the obsolescence and bankruptcy of the old models and take our foot off the neck of youth and honor uh, an interest in psychedelic experimentalism, sexual redefining of roles, a new look at how we relate to work, a new look at how we relate to community. Instead of marginalizing youth culture and defining it as a phase, misguided, naive, foolish, we should say these are the uncorrupted people in society who have not yet felt the hammer of the programming and the guilt and the creodes of economic necessity and try to build upward and outward from youth culture rather than uh, suppressing it. For this reason, I will be appearing at a rave tonight that starts after my bedtime. And when you let an artificial label define yourself, then my friend, you have chosen smallness over greatness and minimized yourself confined and divided yourself from others 
And it is an undeniable fact that where there is division, there will be conflict. And conflict starts wars. Therefore, every war has started over labels. It's always us versus them. So the answer to war, racism, sexism, and every other ism is so simple that every politician has missed it. It's the labels. We must rip them off. Isn't it funny how no baby is born racist, yet every baby cries when they hear the cries of another? No matter the gender, culture, or color, proving that deep down we were meant to connect and care for each other. That is our mission, and that is not my opinion. That is the truth in a world that has sold us fiction. Please listen, labels only distort our vision, which is why half of those watching this will dismiss it or feel resistance and conflicted. But just remember, so did the caterpillar before it broke through its shell and became the magnificent butterfly. Well, these labels are our shells and we must do the same thing so we can finally spread our wings. Human beings were not meant to be slapped with labels like groceries and supermarkets. DNA cannot be regulated by the FDA. We were meant to be free and only until we remove them all and stop living and thinking so small will we be free to see ourselves and each other for who we truly are. I mean, science is not reason. Reason is a different domain. And, and I think anything which is unreasonable, ultimately unreasonable, is just patently absurd. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, there's so a lot there. Yeah, so there's, that's Prince Aya that you were talking about. Yeah. And I think I have seen him. Uh, and... That, that, I would say that he is transmitting an integral view. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and that is this idea that I am not black and, and, I, and, 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 I, and, and, and look at me and, I, and, and this idea of labels. That's not postmodern. Postmodern is very much labels still. I mean, postmodernity, your being black is very, very consequential. Right. Uh, you, you know, whatever your, you know, identity is and the identity of your ancestors is still very much you know they're still working that out so what was and, the mckenna part then was that was that integral because i was thinking of him more as like a prophet of what would come yeah i think you know to the i would say what what terence mckenna had to say about the sort of cultural hallucination that we're all in and how our cultures sort of limit us and so forth is uh, I, that's all good. The, the part that felt postmodern to me was the idea of enslavement. Uh, I also know that when he was talking, he was really a postmodernist who was critiquing and, and trying to liberate our generation right. from the, the constraints of modernity. And, uh, and that's actually a, a, an important uh, characteristic that we see in postmodernity. And one of the things we want to leave behind is this idea of we've been victimized, we're enslaved, uh, that there is no absolute truth, that, you know, that um, it's, it's post-modernity tends to be depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, they tend to be in a despair. And, and that, you didn't feel that from P Prince Ao. No. You did not feel that from him. That was a different vibe. Yeah. And that's the integral move to me. I, 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 yeah, I was, I, I hoped so. I mean, that, that's, I thought that, um, I thought what he was saying was not that different from the commercial for the Android thing that we exactly. did before. Yeah. The message behind it, I mean, I didn't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean, no, well, all good. because, because, because now it isn't necessarily so awful of a thing for something to be commercial. Everything is commercial. <laughs> commercial. You know, I know really. It, it doesn't actually mean the same thing, but, but as you know, the Star Trek scene was, was conveying, I think a postmodern idea, which was angry and a little bit depressing. Mm -hmm. And then, and very much oriented on the victim. That's again, great progress, an enormous contribution to human history. Yeah. But there is a stage beyond that where we loosen up, and just start seeing each other and look at each other's eyes and say, wow, there's another person there. Mm. And regardless of your, what you're wearing or what your skin color is or what your culture is, oh, I want to see you and I want to unpack you. you is know. some of that the difficulty in, in, in making that a reality? Like if you, if you, uh, 
if it was 1940 and you lived in a small town somewhere, you could see your neighbors, you would see your neighbors that way as a person, right? But, but as your world expands out because there are newspapers and radio and stuff like that, that personhood begins to get less and less. And now we live in a world where everything is extended like that. Oh, exactly. Not, not that you don't have neighbors, but I mean, you know what I mean? Yes. You're you and I are talking to people, to each other. We've talked many, many times. We've never met before in person. Right. We're, we're a thousand miles away from each other and we've created this online relationship where we have these conversations. And people are listening to us all over the world, literally. Right. And that's actually another one of the things that we can see is just a pattern of evolution is that there's an ever increasing um, bubble of what you're actually aware of. You talked about awareness earlier as being the key. That is absolutely the key. Mm -hmm. And we talk about it as the cognitive line of development is what are you actually able to see? And at first we're able to see our families and, and they're the ones we really care about. And then our bigger you know, communities. And for traditionalists, that's it. The people in our communities, the people in our nation, the people in our religion, the other people do not get moral consideration in the same way. And a lot of people are still there. You know, that's as far as they've gone and that's the way it is. But one of the things that post-modernity does is it becomes world-centric. And this is where we get uh, you know, progressives being so concerned about things like global warming and, you know, the exploitative aspects of capitalism. And so because they can see it. Right. Uh, people at earlier stages, literally, you talk about the world and the Arctic and it's like, you're annoying me. You right. know, it's nice. It's beautiful out here. You know, whatever. I like it a little warmer. Um, and that, and that's, and so that's just a matter of what you're able to see and, and include in your circle of moral consideration. And you can't, you know, I mean, people grow at, you know, at the rate that they grow. Would you say then that the, the step between what McKenna was saying 20 years ago and what Prince Ayo was saying today it, not not sweating the obvious stuff anymore or just like or or i'm trying to figure out what the i'm trying to put my finger on what the the specific difference is between what he was doing like he would agree probably with everything that mckenna was saying but you're saying at that integral stage that he seemed to be transmitting at you drop the victimhood yeah yeah you realize that you're your real identity is, is, is humanity. And God, what a catastrophe this has been, this history of humanity. Yeah. But here we are. And we actually, and this is Prince A, it was beautiful. We yeah. could see, we could agree, we could, you know, we all want to love each other. When one baby cries, another baby cries. That's a beautiful thing. And that's not about redressing past wrongs. Right. That's about moving forward. So the big difference between the two of them, even though you couldn't identify necessarily a, a um, victim, you could a little bit in McKenna, it's, it's actually a, a difference in tone in a lot of it, a lot of, just a difference in the feeling because post-modernity has lost all faith in progress. You know, they basically want to deconstruct mm -hmm. all of these narratives of progress. Integral realizes that there actually is a progress. The progress comes back online. And that we can actually move further into a better world and that that's actually happening. Well, one, one of the two things was explaining a problem and the other one was doing something about it. Yeah. The yeah. other one was acting in real time on the problem, which, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know that much about Terrence McKenna, that's what he was saying. Yes. I mean, he, he very much predicted everything. Sorry about that. <laughs> he predicted everything that came from the advent of the internet and social media. And the, you know, he's he's the guy that that perpetuated that find the others. Like yes. when like when you're feeling down about all the things that he just all the facts that he just reeled off in the and sort of the revelation of, you know, the matrix like red pill or whatever, um, if that depresses you know that you're not alone and through the value, the, you know, this miracle of social media, find the others. 
there are other people who understand what you're saying. And 20 years ago, there were less. Mm -hmm. Now, boy, uh, you know, that, well, that video that I did, the Prince Aya video, when I was looking for something to put on there and I found that it has like 5 million views. <laughs> I Fantastic. Mean, people know who he is, you know, and people are, are getting that message. And again, the, the Android commercial, that was a commercial for a cell phone, but it was, you know, that's a, a hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ad campaign out there. Yeah. That's, that's a huge company. That's a global presence. And the message is quite lovely. Yeah. And just for the people who are listening to this as a podcast, if it's a little bit confusing, what was happening in the Prince Ao video was you could hear only his voice, yeah. but there were maybe 30 or 40 people uh, mouthing it uh, from point. all walks of life, children, colors, turbans, whatever, the whole right. bit. And, uh, and perfectly done. Um, you know, that, that was a, a feat of, 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 of basically movie making there. That was yeah, well, he's a YouTube really celebrity, but there's some money being spent on, on exactly. his Exactly. Great beautiful. job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important point. I, sometimes I forget that you can't see. Um, the idea for me behind what we were just talking about is that the global community our understanding of it is shrinking so that you can see somebody, you can know somebody on the other side of the world and see them as a person, not yeah. just as one of those people who live on the other side of the world. Yeah. And that's, that's more of that cascade of consciousness mm -hmm. of to see is to care. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know why that is, but it is. And to care is to do something. And that's, um, you know, that's what's happening as this internet uh, really does tie us together. And it's an enormous achievement of humanity that we have this. It's not without its downsides. We see all the, saw the downsides with the Russians and, and that sort of thing. And another downside of the internet is that pre-modern people can also use it. Right. And so we had ISIS, actually. It, it was, it too uh, was a function of the internet. It was, or that was a big part of it. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's all of that, you know, tying people together has its downside, but the upside is so much more potent. I think that the, 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 the facts of the evolution of the world and certainly human culture is there's always a downside to every good thing we ever think of. I mean, the, the, the dance, the game that's being played is leaning towards the good side. And, but it's always just barely. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think that people would evolve if it was easy. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's always just a couple of steps away from disaster, and it always has been. Yeah. Now the disasters get higher stakes, but, this, but also the benefits are higher stakes. Now we're talking about, well, and, and seeing, as we discussed in, the, in the, the benefits of the modern mindset last week, we see incredible benefits of, you know, millions of people lifted out of poverty, way less war in the world. War is now m largely, at least in the developed world, a, a, a function of culture wars. Wars are mostly conversations now. That's yeah. huge advancement, but it's all advancements that, that's always done at a razor, on a razor's edge. And yeah. in the last hundred years, the razor's edge has been possible extermination of the of the human race, you know, yeah. but the stakes are higher, but the benefits are better. Yeah. And that's still not off the table that that kind of thing could happen. There's not a sort of a blind optimism to integral, but there is a recognition that there seems to be a, an erotic energy uh, that's sort of built into the cosmos mm. where we unfold to greater stages of competence uh, and ultimately, goodness, truth, and beauty, mm. and and we can see that in history. Erotic, we like, can see, even, like procreative. Gross. Yes, the 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 the, the, the procreate urge huh. uh, that's just built into the into the universe, and and we can see also that strangely, that beauty is created by a lot of ugliness, mm -hmm. and truth is created by a lot of lies, and goodness is created through a lot of bad stuff. And that's just the sort of paradox of the whole thing that, that 
breaking, once we break into integral, we could see that, yeah, that what a heartbreaking fucking catastrophe human history has been. And yet, you know, Dirk got up and wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. You well, know, metaphorically, procreation and birth is messy and dangerous. Yes. It, it usually works out, but sometimes you get syphilis and sometimes the mother and the child might not live. You know, yes. Yes. It's, it's dangerous. Yes. But we and, seem to and, think you know, that and we can see that, you know, there's even though there's still Syria is as ugly as anything has ever been in war. And yet the good news is that it's just Syria and not the whole world, which is what it right. actually used to be in pre-modern times. Everybody was constantly fighting. Right. So, yeah. So uh, you don't want to lose track of the, you know, heartbreak and what still needs to be done. Uh, but you also don't want to feel like you're, I, I, I know when I was in my uh, uh, Masters of Divinity program at Naropa University, this Buddhist, very progressive, postmodern program, wonderful people. But the highest calling was to sit with the suffering of the ever darkening world. And that's, and that's that sort of depressed postmodern, you know, maybe we could at least make it easier for people. And you, we can serve as we die, you know, as we, and, and no, you know, we need something more than that. And, mm -hmm. and that's the, a new integral wave that's coming online that has, uh, you know, common sense solutions and let's just work it out and right. see each other. And it's not that complicated, but it is a liberation from these past um, world spaces. Common sense solutions are possible when you get rid of the baggage. Yes. Because the ideologies. I, at, at, at my generation, we're literally confused by the baggage. Like, I'm, I, I can't even have a conversation with somebody who is my age, sometimes even a friend, when we disagree on these things. Because it's like, all right, it's going to take me... 45 minutes to walk through all of the things that I consider to be false premises that this person's based his entire worldview on before we can even talk about whatever the subject is. Yeah. But the kids who were marching the other day, they don't actually even know what those issues are. They don't care and they don't know. There's something right in front of them. So it's like, it's almost like wiping the board clean. Like, no, we're not having that conversation because well, you've been having it for quite a long time. It's not interesting. Which, yes. by the way, every kid has said that in every generation. There is yes. no 17-year-old who didn't say that. But now, because they, there is the access to the information and the access to each other in numbers, well, like I said a half an hour ago, they could have all walked out of school yesterday and not told anybody, which would have been haunting <laughs> right. I mean, it, could you, I mean, it, I mean, because it kind of is anyway, but we're, we're used to it, you know, but like the people that I know that are very kind of upset about this and feel like these children are being manipulated by liberals and stuff like that. They kind of expect that at this point, but boy, they could, if they did it without telling anybody, <laughs> you know, it, the, haunting. Yes. That's what that would have done. That, well, that, that, we may see that. Stop the world and go, what the fuck just happened? I, I hope I live to see it, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to miss it while it's happening right now. No. You know, I don't, I don't want to analyze it. Thank you. Because it's... Me too. I mean, what I didn't, I didn't mean to be offering an improvement over what they did. What they did was, was absolutely awesome. I hope they do it again. Yep. Um, I yeah. I don't think they're going anywhere. No, I think they're going to grow up. And when yep. they grow up, if they could grow into some of this power that they just tapped into, that wasn't there before. That's what I'm saying. Every 17-year-old kid had those thoughts, but they didn't have that kind of power. And, and I really, really hope they continue to talk to people that are older than them. This needs to be done. Use this power responsibly, you know, Harry Potter, right? Like, th you could blow up the world like this. Like if you have that much power and like I, like the other thing I said before, if every 18 year old is going to vote, I hope they vote as responsibly as, as they're handling this moment right now. You know what I mean? Because 
look, we just elected someone who doesn't even want to be there, right? So what if he wanted to be there? What if, what if, what if he had a plan, right? There's a lot of people out there who also have billions of dollars who are a lot smarter than Donald Trump. And if one of, one of them had a plan, like, hey, you know, I'd like to be like Vladimir Putin. I would like to destroy democracy. That would be kind of cool. Well, they could. So uh, I hope, I hope they, that the 16 to 25 or 30, whatever, however old they are, I hope they continue to uh, tap into the wisdom of the people that are 10 or 15 years older than that. Because, you know, we've seen some shit and we're excited about what you guys are doing, but whew, it, you know, you've, you're holding Excalibur in your hand, so be careful what you do with it. Yeah, right on. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Right. Yeah, thanks, Steve.